In our Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 18, we're going to begin in verse 19. Uh, we uh, saw last time that there was a battle and Absalom uh, stood before David. And we know that Absalom died. Absalom, the Bible finishes the life of Absalom by saying he built a pillar for himself. That was his story. But yet he ended up under a pile of stone. So from a pillar of self to a pile of stone, that's his life. But you know, after war, there's always consequences. And here David is going to mourn for his son Absalom. And let me give you the message before we start reading, and then we'll go into the message after we read. I'm going to deal with a subject this evening that I wasn't thinking about until I, I was studying this passage. But I want to speak on this. When grief becomes selfish. When grief becomes selfish. Notice 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse number 19. Then said Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, let me now run and bear the king tidings, how that the Lord hath avenged him of his enemies. And Joab said unto him, Thou shalt not bear tidings this day, but thou shalt bear tidings another day. But this day thou shalt bear no tidings, because the king's son is dead. Then said Joab to Cushai, Go tell the king what thou hast seen. And Cushai bowed himself unto Joab and ran. Then said Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, Yet again to Joab, but howsoever let me, I pray thee, also run after Cushai. And Joab said, Wherefore wilt thou run, my son, seeing that thou hast no tidings ready? But, who, but however, said he, let me run. And he said unto him, Run. Then Ahimaaz ran by the way of the plain, and overran Cushai. And David sat between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate unto the wall and lifted up his eyes and looked and behold a man running alone. And the watchman cried and told the king and the king said if he be alone let there be tidings in his mouth. There is tidings in his mouth and he came apace and drew near. And the watchman saw another man running and the watchman called unto the porter and said behold another man running alone. And the king said he, is also, bring, uh, he also bringeth tidings. And the watchman said me thinketh the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, He is a good man, and cometh with good tidings. And Ahimaaz called and said unto the king, All is well. And he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king, and said, Be blessed, be the Lord thy God, which hath delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against my lord the king. And the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Ahimaaz answered, when Joab sent the king's servant, and me thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. And the king said unto him, Turn aside and stand here. And he turned aside and stood still. And behold, Cushai came, and Cushai said, Tidings, my lord the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day of all them that rose up against thee. And the king said unto Cushai, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushai answered, the enemies of my lord the king, and all that rise against thee to, uh, to do thee hurt, be as that young man is. And the king was much moved, and went up to the chamber over the gate, and wept. And as he wept, uh, and as he went, thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Verse 9, chapter 19, verse 1, and it, and it was told Joab, Behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people, for the people heard that day how, that, how the king was grieved for his son. And the people get, uh, got them by stealth that day into the city, as people being ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. But the king covereth his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And Joab came into the house of the king and said, Thou hast shamed this day the faces of all thy servants, which this day have saved thy life and the lives of thy sons and of thy daughters and the lives of thy wives and the lives of thy concubines, in that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends. For thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither princes nor servants. For this day I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all we had died this day, then it had pleased thee well. Now therefore arise, go forth and speak comfortably unto thy servants. For I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry one with thee this night. 
and that will be worse unto thee than all the evil that befell thee from the youth until now. Then the king arose and sat in the gate, and they told unto all the people, saying, Behold, the king doth sit in the gate, and all the people came before the king, for Israel had fled every man to his tent. Now we're going to stop here. This is uh, the... Uh, the aftermath, if you, were, you would, of the war. And David hears of the death of his son Absalom. And there's going to be uh, kind of a, a turmoil going on in the nation of Israel because uh, some of the Israelites wanted David back and some didn't. And so we're going to see that next week. But uh, this evening, I want to deal on this subject when grief becomes uh, selfish. The fact of the matter is that David, uh, or Absalom's death was a good thing. It was a good thing. Now, we know that David said, do not touch my son. That was the instruction. But may I say the death of Absalom was a good thing? He was a rebel. He was out to kill his father. Uh, he was a liar, an adulterer, a man who was a very wicked man. If the outcome had been Absalom wins and David loses, the outcome for Israel is very bad. But David remained the king. That's a good thing. Now David is grieving for his son. And before we go into the message, I want to say that grief is not bad. Mourning is not bad. When we lose loved ones, and I'm sure every single person has lost at some point in their lives loved ones, whether it be a maid or a child or a grandparent, everybody has lost someone dear to their heart in their lives. Grief is not bad. But the Bible talks about how the believer does not a sorrow as those that have no hope. In other words, for the believer, sorrow, grief, mourning ought to be different for the child of God than it is for out in the world. Now, as we go into this passage, I want us to remember that David had mourned for a son that had already died. That was his first son. You remember with the sin with Bathsheba? And the child was taken, and we saw how David responded. That mourning was... Good morning. It was good grief. But this morning and this grief on the part of David is not good. And we're going to see that this evening. I want us to deal, before we go into David and look at David and Joab, the interaction there, I want us to consider the por first portion we read and really study this portion because there's lessons here that we can learn as the carriers of the news come. We see, first of all, notice the carriers of the news. From verse 19 down to verse 32, we have this interaction going on between Ahimaaz and Cushai. Now, these, uh, these two men uh, are dedicated from 19 to verse 32, which is... The they were just delivering a message. But there's a lesson for us here that we can learn of these two men. Uh, we have the record of the message being delivered to King David. There are lessons in this passage that the Holy Spirit wants us to learn. We are introduced to two men. Ahimaaz, now we know about him already. He is the son of Zadok the priest. Now if you remember, when Absalom was thinking about going after David, the news got to, obviously, the priests that were there, and we saw the counsel that was given to Absalom, and the news went, and it was a friend of David, and the news was communicated to Zadok the priest. Zadok the priest told his son Ahimaaz, and Ahimaaz brought the message to David. So we already know about Ahimaaz, and here he is, one of those messengers, but the other one is Cushai. Now, Cushai, I, I don't know if this is his name, or perhaps he was a Cushite. I don't know, that is a, a group of people. So perhaps it was just his name, or he was from the nation of Cushai, so therefore this was a nickname for him. But up to this point, we don't know nothing about him. These two men are quite the contrast in their behavior during this time of war. Let us examine, first of all, the characteristic of faulty character, because we see two characters in this lesson this evening before, as they bring the message, the bad news to David. Notice the characteristics of faulty character, and by the way, when I talk about faulty character, I'm talking about Ahimaaz. Ahimaaz had already been used as a messenger in chapter 15 and verse 36. He was the son of Zadok the priest, as we saw. The last we saw of him, he was used to bring the news to David of what Absalom was planning against David. So, what he did was a good thing. But here we see his faulty character. Firstly, we see his faulty character because he was interested in the wrong things. We see, first of all, in other words, how do we know when a character is faulty? Because of what that person is interested in. Now, what was Ahimaaz interested in? He was interested, first of all, 
in praise. You say, well, how do we know that? Well, notice verse 19. Then now the battle is over. God puts in the word right there, a little last sentence about Absalom, who had built himself a pillar. But notice how Ahimaaz hears kind of the news. He says, Let me now run and bear the king tidings, how that the Lord hath avenged him of his enemies. And Joab said unto him, Thou shalt not bear tidings this day. Now we know that, that Joab wanted to communicate the message to the king. But he had already selected someone to deliver that message. But here Ahimaaz presents himself, if you would, to deliver the message. Ahimaaz became very forward about pushing himself on Joab to run and bring a message to the king. He was pushy about it. He was not requested. He was not asked to. Later in verse 22, Then said Ahimaaz, after Joab sends Cushai, deliver the message to the king. Verse 22, Then said Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, yet again to Joab, But who, however, let me, I pray thee, also run after Cushai. And Joab said, Wherefore wilt thou run, my son, seeing that thou hast no tidings ready? But however, said he, let me run. Do you see the insistence there? What was he interested in? He was interested in praise. Let me deliver the news to the king. Please, Joab, let me deliver the news. Let, can I bring the message? After twice, Joab says, no, the third time, says, just let me run. He says, go ahead, run. You see, Ahimaaz did not like the orders of Joab and therefore began to argue with him. Why? Because he is interested in praise. He's not interested in the message. We're going to see that by the end of the story. There is no message there. That's why David tells him, turn aside, look away. Why? Because there was no message there. Ahimaaz was interested in praise and not about delivering a message. In verse 22 and 23, the Bible says, and we see again the interaction which shows us here, Ahimaaz had made his mind no matter what the facts were. Joab told him, he says, you don't know what's going on. You have no idea what's going on. I'm, I've already sent a Cushai to deliver the message. And we will see later that Ahimaaz had nothing of value to say to the king. Why then did Ahimaaz want to run to, to, to bring this message? Why did he want to do that? He wanted to do that because he was interested in praise. So, that's faulty character. Faulty character is interested in praise. But number two, faulty character is interested in performance. Now notice verse 23. The Bible tells us, But however, said he, let me run. And he said unto him, run. Then, notice verse 23, Ahimaaz ran by the way of the plain and overran Cushai. Now we know he was a fast runner. The Bible says here uh, that as the uh, porter uh, saw the first runner come in, he said, wow, there's something particular about the way this man runs, and they recognized it was a Hemaz. He must have been recognized as a very fast runner, but that's exactly what he was interested in. Performance. You see, Ahimaaz was obviously a very fast runner, but we must remember that the speed in which he ran did not matter what mattered was the message. Isn't that the truth? You see, Ahimaaz was more concerned about beating Cushai than about having the right message. Ahimaaz was the first runner seen by David. Hence, this is what he was looking for. Right? He's looking for praise. He's trying to get there before Cushai. He's trying to deliver the message, and he gets there, and there's no message. Now, he said what he said, but that's not what the answer that David was looking for. You see, faulty character is interested in praise and performance to the neglect of the message. The Bible says in verse 29 that the king said to the young man, Absalom, is Absalom safe? And Ahimaaz answered, when Joab sent the, the king's servant and me thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. Then why are you here? You, you don't know what happened? Then why are you here? Either he was lying or he didn't know what happened. Either way, he's, he's a bad messenger. Ahimaaz was either lying or ignorant about what was going on. In either case, he failed in his delivery of the message. He was either unfaithful in speaking the truth or unfaithful in learning the truth. In 2 Samuel verse, in verse 18, in chapter 18, verse 30, the king said unto him, Turn aside and stand here. And he turned aside and stood still. You see, the message of Ahimaaz was rejected by the king. Faulty character is interested in praise and performance. But number two, we see the characteristic of faithful character. 
You see, there's a contrast between those two men. The second messenger, unlike Ahimaaz, is unknown up to this time. So perhaps Ahimaaz has a certain advantage because he's a son of a priest, but Cushai, we don't know th nothing about him. Perhaps he's a Cushite. But we see several things. First of all, notice what is faithful character. Faithful character, he was available. You see, the Bible says, Then Joab, in verse 21, said to Cushai, Go tell the king what thou hast seen. You see, Cushai waited for Joab to decide his calling, and he was ready. Unlike Ahimaaz, who threw himself, who was basically self-promoting himself, Cushai was just standing back, waiting for the orders. You see, that's faithful character. He was available, and he was ready. Not only was he available and ready, but Cushai was submitted. In verse 21, the Bible says, Cushai bowed himself unto Joab, and he ran. Isn't that so uh, uh, contrary to how Ahimaaz acted? Three times, or twice, he had to be said no. The third time, uh, she, his insistence, uh, who was in charge? Joab was. Joab was in charge. You see the insubordination, the rebellious spirit on the part of Ahimaaz, but not so with faithful character. Faithful character is submitted. Cushai did not argue or negotiate the orders given. He just did them. Number three, we see not only was he available, he was submitted. Number three, he was obedient. Verse 23 tells us Ahimaaz ran by the way of the plain and overran Cushai. Now we know he didn't have a message, but Cushai had a message. You see, Cushai was not the fastest runner of the two messengers, but he was the most obedient of the two. Which one is more important? If you had to take two guys and say, wow, two guys, you're going to run. One guy doesn't have a message, the other guy has a message, but this one sure runs faster, but he doesn't have a message. The one is not obedient, the other is obedient. But see what the, the faulty character focuses on is performance, but he's better. No, he's not obedient. You see, the emphasis was on the obedience of Cushai. Serving God acceptably, acceptably does not require fame or flashly performances, but it does require obedience. And that's the kind of man Cushai was. So not only do we see his faithful character because he was available, he was submitted, he was obedient, but he was also trustworthy. In verse 29, when Joab sent my servant, notice uh, the, the interaction of verse 29. The king said, is the young man Absalom safe? Now he's talking to Ahimaaz. And Ahimaaz answered, when Joab sent the king's servant and me thy servant, I saw a great tumult and I knew not what it was. Do you see here the, all the um, eyes? <laughs> it pops out, doesn't it? But, but notice Cushai came, and Cushai said in verse 31, Tidings, my lord the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day of all them that rose up against thee. And the king said unto Cushai, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushai answered, The enemies of, of my lord the king, and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt, be as this young man is. Do you see the difference in kind of the interaction? Cushai was all about me, thy servant. The first reference of self. I saw a great tumult, the second reference of self. But I, the third reference of self, knew not what it was. It's all about him. Why? Because he wants the praise. He wants the attention. But Cushai was trustworthy. You see, Cushai, in contrast with Ahimaaz, kept himself out of the message. Ahimaaz referred to himself three times in just one sentence. This is an addendum. John Butler, it was a commentary, he wrote this. Beware of those such as preachers and evangelists who continually insert themselves into their messages. It is a sure sign that they, like Ahimaaz, have defective messages. When self is prominent in the sermon, substance becomes a problem in the sermon. Isn't that, does that describe our world today? Even the Christian world. Why? It's about praise. It's about performance. It's no more about availability, submission, obedience, and trustworthiness. You see, the contrast between these two men as they come and bearing the message, a very important message, at a very dark time in the nation of Israel, God gives much importance to this message because of the amount of verses He dedicates to those two messengers. Therefore, those lessons are, 
we must learn. So not only do we see the carriers of the news, but number two, we see the condition of David. So we know the news as uh, uh, David asks uh, uh, Cushai uh, if his son is alive, and Cushai said, no, he's dead. Notice verse 33, and the king was much, notice the word, moved, and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept, and as he went, thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Now we're going to see this is a ridiculous statement. We're going to see that in just a minute. But the Bible says here, he was moved. The word moved is translated from a Hebrew word which emphasizes the inordinancy of David's mourning. The Hebrew word properly refers to the agitation of the body. Uh, R.P. Smith says it, is, it was a violent trembling seized the king. David, in other words, lost control of himself in his sorrowing. Being moved this strongly by sorrow is not the mark of a man who knows how to mourn properly. And that is when grief becomes selfish. It was out of control. He was out of control. We're going to see what this did, but I want us to examine the condition of David. I want us to see why is it that this grief made David selfish. How can grief make somebody selfish? Exactly what David did here. Now let's examine that for, uh, clearly here. We see in the condition of David, we see first of all, grief becomes selfish when first of all, responsibilities are neglected. Now we're talking about David is grieving. But in his grief, we know that this grief is selfish because his responsibilities were neglected. Notice verse 33. Okay? And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee. O Absalom, my son, my son. Notice chapter 19, verse 4. But the king covered his face and the king cried with a loud voice, O my son Absalom, O Absalom, my son, my son. You see, David's grief kept him from doing his duties as the king and fulfilling his responsibilities after this victory. Now, you say, wow, that, that's kind of mean and that's kind of harsh. Is it? If we know of the situation? Absalom was going to kill David with no hesitation. We already know that. It was either David's head or Absalom's head. That was the only two choices. But hearing the news, we're not saying that David is not supposed to grieve. We're saying that David is not supposed to neglect his responsibilities in his grief. You know, he should have remained at the gate to greet the returning soldiers, but instead he went to the chambers above the gate to get alone to mourn. He forsook his duties in order to mourn. A commentator wrote this, Wise men know that one of the best antidotes for grief is, the faith, is, is be faithful in one's duties. To keep your grief from becoming excessive, keep busy with your duties. Never let mourning cause neglect on your responsibilities. Do you know that that happens all over the world? Where perhaps, and there are many examples, where a mother has children and she loses one child and she goes into so much grief that she neglects all the other children. We're not saying she's not to grieve. We're saying she ought not to neglect the other children. Sometimes people go through, go through devastating loss, but all of a sudden they retract themselves and everybody in their lives becomes non-important and they, they quit their job, they quit everything and everything stops. That is the worst thing they can do. There is a time to grieve, but it must not be prolonged to the neglect of responsibilities. So we see it was selfish because responsibilities were, were neglected. But number two, grief becomes selfish when reasoning blames God. Notice verse 33. What does, what does uh, David say? Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee. Now we look at this in the service. That, wow, he must have really loved his son even though his son wanted to kill him. David dying instead of Absalom dying 
would not have solved any problems. There's a commentator by the name of Blakey, he wrote this, Noble and generous thought to uh, the wish be. It was, a, it was on public ground out of the question. Let us imagine for one moment the wish realized. David has fallen and Absalom survives. What sort of kingdom would it have been? What would have been the fate of the gallant men that had defended David? What would have been the condition of God's servants throughout the kingdom? What would have been the influence of so godless a monarch upon the interests of truth and the cause of God? We know the answer to those questions. You see, David said, Would God? This statement would seem to indicate that David felt God did the wrong thing. Would God I had died for thee? David, that is not. Now, you remember when you first became king? He said, God, I acknowledge that you have made me a shepherd. For this responsibility, I am supposed to feed your people and to be the spiritual leader for people. And here, David, all that is out of his head because that, you really want Absalom to be the next king? This man who has no regard for God, for the men of God, uh, for, uh, for morality, you really want him to be the next king? You see, David's mourning showed disbelief in God's prudence, his power, and his providence. You see, reasoning becomes selfish when responsibilities are neglected and when reasoning blames God. We also see that reality or grief becomes selfish when reality is completely ignored. In chapter 19 and verse 2, the Bible says, And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people. For the people heard say that day how the king was grieved for his son. This, for the nation of Israel, for the men that were following David, ought to have been a time of rejoicing. It ought to have been a time of rejoicing. They can go back to their families and their homes now. Uh, they chose to be loyal and to follow David because they acknowledged that he was the rightful ruler and they loved him and they had been loyal to him for many years, whether he was as the king or before he was the king, as a man who was running away for his life from Saul. But here, during a time of victory, it, turn, it is turned into a time of mourning. You see, the mourning on the part of David uh, was a killjoy. It should have been a time of rejoicing, but instead it was turned, changed, to a time of mourning. So it seems, do you, do you see here, do you see the camp as they all come back? And the soldiers hearing that their king is mourning uncontrollably and screaming, Oh my son Absalom, Absalom, would God I had died for thee. What, what should have been a time when David should have stood at the gate and said, thank you. Good job, men. We got the victory. We, we can go home. We can go back to Jerusalem. Instead of that, there was a time when they were all hanging their heads down. And it, it was turned into mourning. Why? Because of the king. Now, we're continuing to see here this uh, selfish grief because only in the condition of David, but we see the, the condemnation of Joab. Joab is, hears of this in verse 1, and then it was told Joab, Behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. So Joab hears that, and Joab is going to go to the king and confront him. And by the way, Joab, not a good guy, but this is a good thing that he did. You know, you can't discount a bad guy if he does a good thing. Well, yeah, you acknowledge that, that was a good thing. Okay, That's exactly what he did here. He did a good thing. You see, David was co confronted by Joab, and rightfully so. David's inordinate mourning revealed several things. First of all, <clears throat> it revealed this, a disinterest in others. Notice verse number four. But the king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Do you realize that David's excessive mourning was an exhibition of selfishness? David was disinterested in the situation of other people. He could only think of my trouble. 
Do you see that when that turn, be turned selfish? When people just focus on themselves and I'm going through this and I'm going through my trouble and I'm grieving and I want everybody to know I'm grieving, you do not consider all the other people that are grieving and all the other people that have lost someone and loved ones. It's not about you. It's about the plan of God. And there's other people that are hurting out there, David. And instead of using this to encourage them, you're causing their victory to return to mourning. You see, this revealed a disinterest for others. Not only do we see a, a disinterest in others, but we see a dishonor for the soldiers. In verse number 3, the Bible says, And the people got them by stealth that day into the city, as people being ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. Okay, here's the illustration here. People, when they came back to the place where David was, they came in in stealth. You know what that means? Basically, after the battle was raging, there would always be robbers that would come and they would desecrate the bodies of the soldiers. What they would do is they would go and find if they could find money or possessions or metal or gold, anything. They would take from the soldiers. If it was a king, a crown or a sword, whatever they could, they would take those away from the soldiers and they would try to be inconspicuous, not seen. They didn't want to get caught. They didn't want to... You see, for them it's a time to get rich. And they don't want to get caught, so they go in stealth. Do you see the picture? Of As the soldiers ought to have come back in victory, rejoicing. They're coming. Don't be too loud. David's grieving. Can you imagine how that dishonors the, dishonored those men? Those soldiers that had been willing to lay down their lives? Who had fought beside their, their brethren? Their sons? And some of them had died? And now they can't say anything. They have to go in stealth. What dishonor to the soldiers. You see, he it revealed, a condemnation of Joab revealed the disinterest in, in others, the dishonor of the soldiers. Joab told David that his, this excessive mourning brought dishonor to the troops. The Bible uses the word against stealth, and I explained that, but David should have greeted them at the gate and honored them for their exploits, as he had done in time past. But he dishonors them now. We don't only see a disinterest in others, a dishonor for the soldiers. Number three, we see disloyalty to his friends. Joab says in verse six, In that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends. For, though, uh, for, for thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither princes nor servants. For this day I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all we had died this day, then it had pleased thee well. Wow, isn't that a fact? Joab, keep at it, man. I like it. Tell it to him. You see, these friends of David had stood by him through thick and thin for many years. In loyalty to him, they had sacrificed greatly. They had gone, after, uh, uh, gone faithfully to battle and gone daring, life-threatening uh, uh, life, uh, uh, life uh, deeds of war. This morning said he was rooting for the other side to win. Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, would God, I had died for thee. Do you see as the soldiers listened to that? I guess he wished we all died. We, we have followed him through all those years and he was overthrown by his own son and we came and, and helped him. And, and now he wants us to die? Are we his enemies? You see, he was disinterested in others, dishonored the soldiers, disloyal to his friends. But we see also his disaffection towards Absalom. In verse number 7, the Bible says, Now therefore arise, go forth, and speak comfortably unto thy servants. For I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will uh, not tarry one with thee this night, and that will be worse unto thee than all of the evil that befell thee from thy youth until now. You see, this excessive mourning over Absalom was going to drive away his soldiers and his friends. This is what grief, selfish grief, if you would, that's what it accomplishes. It drives away people that want to help. That's what it does every time. You see, David was giving more honor to 
a wretched, murderous, immoral, insurrectionist son than he gave to those who had stood for honor and for God and for David. You can grieve, David, but stand at the gate. You can grieve, David, but show respect for those that have lost others as well. You can grieve, David, but honor your soldiers. You can grieve, David, but don't, don't allow your affection for your son to be greater than for those that have laid down their lives for you. You can grieve, David, but don't be disloyal to your friends. You see, again, faulty character or faithful character. In this instance, David had a faulty character because he allowed his grief to become selfish. May the Lord help us. Every single person that ever lives is going to go through times of grief. Everybody is. But as the people of God, may we never allow that grief to become selfish. You see, we have to turn our eyes upon God, who knows all things, who is the orchestrator, who has got all things in control, who would not allow us to go through anything that he cannot give us the strength to get through. And as the people of God, it is our responsibility to grieve, but to grieve filled with the Spirit of God. And not grieve selfishly. May the Lord help us as we examine this passage and to see. And by the way, I believe that this is going to hurt David. And we're going to see that later uh, because of all that he's going to do. It's almost like he's going to hold a grudge. The next thing he's going to do is going to remove Joab from being the captain of the host and place a, Hema, uh, uh, a Mesa who just went against him as the next captain of the host. So he's not done with this grieving process. He got over it and the Bible says he went down and he went to the people and so good he made a good decision. But he's not grieving well. May the Lord help all of us to grieve as we yield ourselves to God. To grieve as we uh, not pushing away people, uh, but understanding uh, that this time is, is used of the Lord in our lives for God to, to help us. I remember when uh, <clears throat> my uh, brother and sister-in-law went to Africa. And uh, they went there and she was carried for full term. Their uh, first son, Nathan. And they went to Africa, and they got there in Burkina Faso, and went to the hospital. Everything was fine up to the day of the de delivery. And they went to the hospital, and the whole, the whole uh, labor was fine, and the baby came out. And when the baby came out, the baby was not breathing. And the doctors could not figure out what, what happened. They tried to help the child, but it just never took a breath, never breathed on its own. My sister-in-law wrote a post online. You can actually go to their website and read that post on how all this was in the hand of God. And I wrote them a note. I said, look, I, you know, I said, God has allowed you to go through this to encourage many people, to help people. And they grieved. And I remember grieving with them. I remember being on the phone and crying. Grief is okay. But that was not selfish grief. Because they used that for the benefit of the gospel of Jesus Christ. She went to a store after Nathan had died. And a lady said, oh, I see you delivered your child. Where's the, where the child? Not knowing what had happened. What was that? An opportunity presented for the cause of Christ. But if grief was selfish... You don't consider those around you. You don't consider God. You blame God. And therefore, everybody around you is pushed away instead of embraced with the love of God. You see, devastating are the consequences of selfish grief. But really, grief ought to cause us, you know what to do? To move forward, to penetrate this world with the light of God that the world doesn't have. To mourn, but not as the world mourns. 
but to mourn as those that have hope in a God who knows all things and who does what's best in our lives. Let's ask the Lord to help us. When grief becomes selfish,